going to be hot in here because I can't have the fan on because the fan's too noisy. Get that off, I think. For the last few decades, small hatchbacks have been getting on fine by having an engine at the front, driving the front wheels, and a nice space at the back for you to put a bit of stuff. History has given us a few exceptions. This guy's runabout, this country's runabout, and this decade's runabout. Stop! Hammer time! What these exceptions all have in common is that they put the engine at the back, driving the rear wheels. The problem with that, of course, is that it puts a whopping great lump of metal where you'd normally have your jump cables or your dog. Which shifts a load of weight to the back of the car. And as we all know, having a load of weight at the back doesn't really do much for balance. <laughs> you can see what I'm getting at here. This four seat smart is rear engined and rear wheel drive. Smart? Well on the surface, no. See putting the engine back there doesn't leave a great deal of space for much else. As a result the boot is tiny by volume, significantly smaller than an array of similarly sized city cars and smaller even than a Porsche Boxster. And it's not even like they've liberated any space at the front because they've put the battery and stuff there. There isn't much oddman space either because they've scooped the dash out to liberate more lee room. Lee room? <laughs> all eyes, all eyes. To make more knee room. So the glove box is pathetic. Although there is a little tray under the gear stick here. So maybe you can put one of your gloves in there and the other one in the glove box. And there's barely enough room for a Capri Sun in the door pockets, let alone a bottle. There's knee, knee room in here either and not that much headroom. So it kind of makes you wonder, why didn't Smart just make this normal? Well, that's where the Smart stuff comes in. To get back to those boot numbers for a start, if you replace them with the maximum luggage capacity of each car, then the picture changes. And not only can you fold the rear seats completely flat, but you can very easily flip the bases to liberate space enough for tall items. In addition, the especially high loading floor of the boot makes it easy to load and unload stuff, which is actually a very valuable thing. And although there isn't much rear leg space, it's fine for little kids. The doors open especially wide too, which, assuming you're not in a car park, makes entrance and aggress easy, especially if you've got little bends. It means exit? Ah, no, that means children. Sorry. And on the road, one particular advantage of this layout is that it allows the front wheels more space to move. So, you end up with a turning circle that's tighter than Arsenal's back four. Hell no! Not today's Arsenal, the old Arsenal. Look though, the turning circle it has is amazing for a small car. I mean, it's pretty much a London taxi. And then this. The fact it's proper short really helps too. Not a phrase you'll hear very often. Making it quite the formidable city car when it comes to the usual stuff. You know, parking in tight spaces and going under the Tyne Bridge for a publicity shot for some egg chasing competition. The 4.4 is arguably today's Mini. Weirdly though, it's not quite as nimble as you would expect it to be on the move. There's quite a lot of dead in the center of the steering wheel. And actually when it does sharpen up, then there's loads of body roll, so it kind of tilts left and right quite a lot. With that characteristic in mind, it's then really strange to note that the ride quality is really firm. It's really juddery. The dram position's okay, you kind of sit high, which makes you feel like front visibility is good, especially because the bonnet's so short and you're so close to the windscreen. But the steering wheel doesn't adjust for reach, which might be a problem for some. And that's kind of like a small car characteristic and one that, say, the Volkswagen Up doesn't have. Because this is a city car, you would expect the automatic version to be the one to go for, you know, convenient around town and all that. Especially given that this is one of those clever twin clutch automatics, so it's really quick shifting. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to get enthused about the gearbox because of the way it's been programmed. So for a start at low speeds, it's got this real binary like on off characteristic that makes it really difficult to pull away smoothly. But when you get going, the kick down's lazier than- Change the channel to Sky One, will you? The remote is here, but I cannot be asked to do it myself. <laughs> Very good. The quality is pretty standard city car stuff, but then the textures are okay, and I like these little domes for the air vents and this little dome for the rev counter. And actually, if your car doesn't have sat nav, you can get this clever little phone holder that attaches to the radio. To the engines, then. There's not a great deal of pace available from any of the engines, and they're even slower if you spec an automatic gearbox. Fun fact, the amount of torque that the 71 horsepower engine has is exactly the same as the amount you needed to pull a ring pull off a can of pop in the 80s. Just from the taste of it, Diet Coke. That's 
definitely true. And even the Brabus only 109 horsepower version takes 10 and a half seconds to get to 62. Brabus being the company that brought us, among other things, the 217 miles per hour 900 rocket. So in a nutshell, you're definitely gonna wanna stretch to the three cylinder turbo engine, either one of them which will give you at least enough power to safely overtake a horse. But how far you'll want to stretch up the spec range depends on how flush you're feeling. That phrase applies to all cars, of course, but here it is especially true. There are about a gazillion spec combinations with this car. So because of this cornucopia of trim options, what we'll do is we'll concentrate on what you get as standard. Pure is the entry level car and it comes with not much. Plastic wheel trims, etc. Although it is a fairly cheap way of getting into one of these, and all the safety stuff that gives this a four star Euro NCAP rating is present and correct too. Albeit the Volkswagen Up of similar dimensions has a five star rating. Speaking of which, the Up also mugs off the 4.4 when it comes to price too. And that's because while the most you can pay for an Up is this, the 4.4 range tops out at this. <laughs> And that's the main thing about the 4.4. It only costs an extra 500 quid for one of these over an equivalent 4.2, which is actually in itself great value for the extra two seats. But however you dress it up, if you want to reasonably spec one of these, you're looking at a 15 grand car at least. You know, alloy wheels, maybe a touchscreen and a sunroof. For that money, it doesn't offer much more than a top end up beyond subjective personality. You kind of have to ask yourself, is that really worth paying the extra for? Which is what makes the 4.4 strangely difficult to recommend especially for a car that I like so much, and I really do like it. It's unusual and original both to look at and to drive. And it's the sort of car you want to love and probably will love if you decide to buy one. It's just that it's too expensive in a class that's full of brilliant little cars. So there you have it. Thanks for watching. Go to hj.co.uk for a more fully featured review of the Smart 4.4 and any other car that you care to look at. And please subscribe to the channel if you liked what you just saw. Our subscriber base is pathetic compared to the YouTubers that my kids watch. And all they do is play video games and scream. Is, is that... Is... Ah! Oh my God! What's happening in the world?